Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Um, we're going to start so that we can finish, fingers crossed, on time, although I think we're a little bit over. But um, it is our last session of the day now, and this one is about health and well-being. As many of you know, it's a huge area of concern for the police, and uh, we know there's a lot of good work that's going on. We've heard a bit about that today. But to tell us lots more, we've got two keynote speakers, and they are... Andy Rhodes, OBE, QPM, and Director of the National Wellbeing Service. Andy, do you want to come on up? And also, please welcome Jill Scott Moore, who's the CEO of Police Care UK. Let's give them both a round of applause. <laughs> Are you going to speak first? Yes, yep. great. great. I'm on first. So, hello, everybody. And, um, Really uh, privileged to share the stage here with Jill. Um, we were just chatting earlier on today, known each other for a long time. Uh, Jill and her charity sponsored our first ever conference in the days when we were just a working group and has continued to support us. And I know you know lots of forces across the service with the work since, so it's really nice to be back on the stage together. And uh, I'm going to talk today about something specific. I came and talked at the Superintendent's Conference, I think in about 2017-18, Paul Griffiths will get me right on the, on the actual year, it was pre-Covid anyway, that's where we sort of, everything's defined by was it before or after Covid, and I, I put a picture up, a photograph of myself from the uh, Blackpool Gazette, a notoriously interesting newspaper, uh, when I was a superintendent at Blackpool, and it was a picture of me that uh, had me looking absolutely shot at. And I put that picture up um, to show, actually, make a point that things can catch up on you. And at the time, um, I was going through a divorce, I was in a bad shape, and I had horrendous sleep problems. And I was functioning as a superintendent running firearms jobs, didn't speak to anybody at work about it. And I was making the point back then that this is a stigmatised issue, it's another issue in policing around our health that we normalise. It's one of our strengths that when we're exhausted we keep going. Um, but we've done a lot of work since then, I'm going to update you on that, the research, and I'm going to talk about a really interesting, exciting, highly innovative programme that we've been running with John Moores University and Merseyside Police that's now branching out across the service um, and uh, talk about that in some detail. When I did that conference, I did one of those slidos where, you know, you ask people a question, you don't know who's answered it, but you get a sort of percentage score. And I said, how many people in the audience um, take um, either medication or herbal remedies to support them with the sleep? Now, some people in this audience might have been there then. Can anybody have a guess at how many people on Slido said that they took either herbal remedies or, or, or medication to support them with their sleep? Anybody want to throw out a percentage that they think that was at the Supers conference about five or six years ago? Eight, somebody say 80? Yeah, it was 82%. And I thought, ooh, I wasn't expecting to get that, actually. Um, and busy people with a lot of responsibility and a lot of exhaustion. So I'm going to talk about sleep, fatigue and recovery in the biometrics programme that we are working with with John Moores University and Merseyside Police. Paul Court's here, um, Mr Technology, he knows all about this, that we've been doing in Merseyside for some time. Why are we doing it? First thing is that we can now link a lot of our survey data, the research, not just here but abroad, to a lot of these key issues that are bothering policing at the moment. We've got a lot of new recruits who are struggling with shift work. Uh, the work we've done in Merseyside was initially focused on new recruits, tracking them through from educational phase into shift working, operational phase, and having a look at our biometric data around sleep fatigue recovery. Fascinating. I've got lots of uh, research, the HSE stance, Chief Medical Officer, we've got Professor John Harrison here now, who is it's a new role in policing, but we have finally got an expert at the helm for us to start looking across all these things that we talk about in policing and, and giving us that expert view. Safe driving, you probably know a lot of this stuff, right? Being fatigued and exhausted is effectively like operating when you're drunk. And if we were turning our teams out at three o'clock in the morning, or you were running a firearms job or SIO in something or running 
contact management or whatever it was, when you were drunk, you'd probably be in trouble, right? So there's a lot of whys around this. Our survey for three or four years has picked up fatigue. It's a perceptual survey, but it's of tens of thousands of people. We ask people, how many hours sleep do you think you've got had? How fatigued do you feel you are? Year on year, that's come right up to the top of the list that Durham University present back to us and tell us the things that are bothering people in policing, and particularly for us, obviously, the health issues and what sort of support have we got out there for people. So what we do is we go and do deep dive research. And we go to best in class Washington State University Sleep Center, Surrey University Sleep Center. And we do lots of different research studies. One in particular that I think is absolutely fascinating is one that we did on over 300 response officers. And we put, put medical grade devices on these officers for a week. 24 hours a day. So we're tracking their data 24 hours a day. The results of that study say that uh, over 50% of those officers had w at least one probable diagnosable sleep disorder. Right? And we'd, so we start doing a lot of resource, a lot of educational stuff around this. It's a highly stigmatized, difficult thing to talk about. People generally don't turn up at work and go sick because they're exhausted they go sick for other reasons. So it's potentially also a precursor issue to a lot of the other things that people present with when they're not well at work. And shift work particularly on call, you know, the people in this room, there are a lot of people in this room who um, operate under that sort of environment all the time. So if I was to ask you in this room today, and I know we, Jill and I have got the wellbeing slot, which is, just after you've eaten cake, brownies, lunch, but before the big uh, meal tonight, how many people got out of bed this morning thinking, I feel a million dollars, I'm well up for it? <laughs> That's, I've even got a laugh out of that, haven't I, right? Right, you know, and people have got busy lives, haven't we? People have, I've seen people around here they've, on work emails, they've got things they're dealing with at home. Everybody's got all this. We've got this always on culture and humans were not engineered to exist in an environment where everything's open 24 hours a day, right? That is just fact. That's how the world works now and there is a sleep problem across the world. And in an environment like policing, other emergency services, shift working environments, um, this is a big problem. There is a, in two years time, Washington State University, will say there will be a roadside test to check how fatigued a driver is. This is how big a problem drowsy, drive, drowsy driving is, particularly in the States, the amount of deaths and serious injuries from it. Yeah, and we lose colleagues to drowsy driving every now and again, as does the health service. You'll be able to tell on a roadside test how much sleep you have or haven't had in the last 24 hours. And my position in that is if we're gonna, we're gonna be asked to do that sort of thing, let's get our own house in order and there's a lot of good work going on across policing to try to do that. Internationally, we see tons of research going on now around sleep fatigue recovery, and it's, they are linking it, um, particularly in um, law enforcement environments where they're fully armed. There's a very interesting study in the States about officers that work their rest days, which they do a lot there, but people do it here a lot, right? And they have, found, they have proven that those officers that work more rest days and don't get those rest days to recover have higher proclivity to use force and lower decision make, higher decision-making bias. So their decision-making bias is um, worse and their proclivity to use force is also higher. So we're putting people into very, very sensitive policing environments dealing with high pressure situations, if they're fatigued and they're not recovered, it's an operational risk. It's a risk to them and their health and their families, first and foremost, as, but when you look at the public impact, there's a, there's, this is what is, uh, a lot of work internationally is going around this. The Federation have run a big campaign target fatigue for this very reason. And one of the things that, and we're talking also about fatigue risk management, this coming into police, it's already there actually, the HSE require us to do certain things where we've got shift workers. It's a bit like working time directives, working time directive, it's easier said than actually to implement in an operational environment. 
And so um, that's something that we're working on um, with the MPCC, with the Fed and uh, the health and safety people to have a look at what we can bring into place. But what we wanted to do for one of the first times that I've known in my service in policing is start to look at what technology and data solutions are out there and try to build something ourselves that meets our needs rather than buying off the shelf. So what have we done? So over on the left hand side, what we've done is we did, um, we funded a study with John Moores University, who've been a fantastic research partner, working with Merseyside Police, uh, with uh, Chief Constable Serena Kennedy and her team, where we basically got some free devices, commercial products, started putting them on new recruits and tracked them into operational phase. The people who were looking at the data of the new recruits were saying to us, <coughs> literally after three or four weeks, this is not gonna be good. Right, what we're seeing, it's anonymised, the data, but you can see the trends. We are, what we're seeing in their data is a, uh, uh, they're not even prepared in the way that their lifestyle is being carried out for shift working. You can see in this biometric data, this is the bad news folks for anybody who's wearing one, um, alcohol massively flags up. On, on biometric data, certain aspects of data. And I know there's people in the room here who are really uh, quite experienced in all that sort of thing, and so they'll attest to that. It's not that you can't drink, but you can see the impact of drink on your recovery, right? And these new recruits are going out every weekend and hitting it hard, right? And you can see their data isn't recovering until Tuesday, and they're about to shift working. And what are new recruits saying to us about why they might be leaving or they can't do shift work? Work-life balance. To me, there's something in there with the new generation of people who are coming in that are, are quite surprised about the impact of shift work on their lifestyle, their health, and that trade-off that probably many of us in this room took in our stride they're not prepared to make anymore. So there's a big gap in training new recruits in how to educate them around how to build positive coping strategies in to deal with shift working, and then their sleep fatigue recovery. We've got response officers in one force who think a good pre-sleep routine after nights is a triple espresso and an hour on Call of Duty gaming. That's probably the two worst things you can do, right, to try and get a decent sleep after shifts. We've expanded it out, we've started to fund it, uh, we've tested lots of commercial devices, we've got people in that third box, we've had OK teams, Roku, CT, menopause group, RPU, contact custody, it's really taken off in Merseyside in firearms because a firearm sergeant, one of the team that deployed to deliver Kobo shooting, reached out and heard about the study with John Moore's University and said, my team's exhausted, can we get involved in this? And he's been a real advocate for this. And the important thing to recognise there, and John Moore's have picked this up in their study, is peer support is very important, right? Nobody in that firearms team, if the inspector goes in or the superintendent and asks them how many pronies had the night before, are gonna tell them, right? They do not even want the job to see their data. So the learning that we've got is we have to set this up so the data is confidential, uh, and the way that we set this up is to build trust, which I'll talk about in a minute. But what they will do is talk to each other about it. The collision investigation team inspector said the big bonus for him out of this program so far is people are coming to work and talking about their sleep, their recovery, light management, stuff like this that people didn't know about before, how much alcohol they've had, how they recover, what they talk to their families about, etc., etc. Absolutely fascinating. And we're branching it out now with about another 10 forces who are interested in getting involved in phase two. So we've settled on a device. Uh, the developers, we've picked this device because the developers are happy to basically co-produce this with us. And we've built functions into this device that actually are tuned in to what the people on the front line or people like yourselves are saying that we need. Um, the data is stripped out. Uh, you know, people in, the, in here, this room, who's got Garmin, hands up Garmin wearers? Yeah, Apple Watch, loads of Apple Watches. Anybody got a Aura Ring? Whoop bands? Yeah, you're in sort of anorak territory now with Aura Rings, very expensive. We put Aura Rings out there actually, great piece of kit. The problem is with it, a lot of the data that's presented, there's too much of it. 
you can't really um, make sense of it in terms of sleep fatigue recovery. So it's not a fitness um, intervention we've developed here, it's a uh, specific to this. So uh, anybody from Hampshire police in here? Must be somebody from Hampshire. Yeah, uh, Sarah Glenn worked with a guy called Nick Littlehales many years ago around sleep. He's the guy in the middle, did all the sleep and fatigue recovery coaching for Man United back in the day, Real Madrid, Team Sky, the Rio Olympics team. He's like the Noel Gallagher of sleep, this guy. You know, what he doesn't do is over scientific. He, he talks about science, but he's not a scientist, that's what he says. And he talks about normal people, normal lives, and what you can do outside of your sleep to improve the benefit of what you get really good restorative sleep. So it's all about what you do outside your sleep. We've been working with him and he's gonna be doing all the sort of uh, coaching and educational side for us. And then the other thing that's really interesting is we get anonymized de-identified data out the back end of this system that's, that we start to display. And it starts for the first time giving people like Professor Harrison and senior leaders, HR leaders in policing, occupational health leaders, factual data about key, key insights, data insights into the health of our people in, these, in these, these areas. So over on the left is the new recruits biometric data from the cohort. What you'll see is heart rate variability, I can't go into it in detail now, but heart rate variability, if it's high, you're in rest and digest, you're in rest and recover. If it's low, you're in fight or flight. So it's an indicator of whether your body's wired up or it's relaxed. It's high is good. So the light blue is recruits in educational phase. Their HRV is higher than their resting heart rate, which is the green circle. That's how it should be. Yeah, everyone's baseline is very different. It's very unique. When we move to 90 days on shifts, you'll see the two data sets have already flipped round. Their heart rate variability is now generally lower than their resting heart rate. That's the wrong way round. And these are data sets over a considerable period of time, the trend lines, right? So this is a Tableau uh, Data Insights dashboard. I only put this up to show a little bit of what the art of the possible is when we get these data sets together. We will be able to, and we're already starting to do this, working with the College of Police in uh, a data insights organisation to push this data, including assaults data um, and trauma tracker data, into data insight dashboards. This is factual stuff. So we're moving from our big surveys that are perceptual. People feel they're tired, they feel they're exhausted, they're saying they're not getting enough sleep, and we're getting real factual data back from inside the bodies of the people who are actually working in policing. Totally anonymized, totally secure. And that will have impact for us. So what have we learned so far? I've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm starting to speed up now. My HRV is starting to go lower. My heart rate's starting to go higher. Um, we've learned that involving staff, like any technology, if you can co-produce that with your staff, the adoption rate will be higher. So we're constantly gonna be doing that. This will always be evolving, uh, this product. And it is not commercially viable for anybody to come in and try to supply this as a commercial product. It isn't, it's just too expensive. It's got to be subsidized and it's gotta be built with the people who are using it. So we used a company, we got free devices off them, really good if you're an extreme fitness fanatic. Um, and what you get is information on there from her, a Hawaiian surfer telling you that it's good to eat mango for breakfast. And the feedback from the response officers in Merseyside was, not really relevant to me in Toxteth this morning on earlies. I'm lucky to get a break or a bacon sandwich. So we need stuff that's like fit for purpose. Senior leader buy-in, Serena Kennedy's wearing a device. Won't mind saying she took it off when she went to Turkey for a holiday because she couldn't bear to see the impact of having too much wine when she was on her holidays. Because you will see the impact of this on, um, on your, li your lifestyle on this device. So it takes a lot of input from yourself, but you've also get educated about how this data relates to certain things that are happening in your life. And um, peer is really, peer support is really important. This is the study we're doing with John Moores. Um, that 
biometric data on the left is when I got man flu, which as everyone in the room will know is far worse than anything anybody else could get. Um, so you will, elite sport teams are using this technology to predict outbreaks of illness before it happens because they don't want the NFL team, the one person in the NFL team to give them all the flu or a bug uh, before playoff time. What we're doing is trying to bring the same level of technology that elite sports teams have to our people who we believe do an elite <coughs> job for us, keeping the public safe, right? And they get up every day and they do it again and again and again. Um, so really pleased that we've got John Moores involved in this because uh, they're a great research partner and they've got a great relationship with Merseyside Police. So finally, 16 seconds to go. My idea for this is that one day we'll be doing big deployments of our officers and staff. We'll have lots of their devices out and we'll be able to see in their data before they return to force or after particular events just how exhausted they are so we can tailor our support for them when they come back. And with that, that dead on almost, I'll pass over to you, Jill. You've got a countdown thing on here. We were a bit worried, weren't we, about how we'd actually see that little timer, but it's big enough. So thanks very much, folks. If you want to speak to me about it, come see me. Thanks, Andy, and no pressure there. I'll uh, keep my eye on the clock. Um, so, yeah, um, Police Care UK. Um, I've titled this Making a Difference, um, and hopefully, at, at the end of sort of this session, um, you'll have a, an understanding of, uh, of some of the stuff that we do around making a difference um, and uh, how you might be able to help. Um, but for those of you who are not aware of Police Care UK, and I hope that's not too many of you in the room, especially as we're the charity of the year for the Superintendent's Association, so thank you very much uh, for that, Paul. Um, for those of you who um, are just a reminder that Paul is one of our trustees and is a great source of support for me personally, but also for the charity. Um, but a little bit of context. We're independent. We cover the whole of the UK. Um, we've been around, our roots go back to 1926, um, when the National Police Fund was set up, um, then fast forward 1966, the Police Dependents Trust was set up, um, and then we subsequently merged the two charities to form Police Care UK in 2018. Um, as a charity, all of the um, activities that we do are free and um, will help for individuals and the work that we do uh, with the police service. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, we don't receive any state, state funding, which is why fundraising is so important to us. We're not a subscription-based charity. Um, we are absolutely dependent upon our ability to, to raise funds, which total around three, th three million pounds a year in terms of our running costs. So um, it's an on, not an insubstantial challenge. Um, all the work we do is entirely confidential. Um, we, we don't share any information uh, with forces around individuals, um, whether they are in service, whether they're post-service, or the work that we do with families. And for those of you who don't uh, you know, uh, follow us on social media, those of you who are still able to access social media with all the restrictions in terms of uh, how that gets used these days, um, our Twitter handle is PleaseKUK, um, and there's our website details there. Um, so, just to recap, serving police officers, veteran police officers, veteran police staff, um, and, and serving police staff, we cover the whole gambit um, across all countries, so um, not an insubstantial uh, reach in terms of the work that we do. When I was asked to talk today, I did think, well, actually, what do I talk about? Because there is a huge range of, of sort of areas that, that we're involved in um, that I could share some insights and reflections uh, with you on. Um, and, you know, mindful that there was a brief around sort of making sure there was some CPD element in there. And CPD is about sort of, you know, learning and reflecting and being able to take, go away and take some action. So, so hopefully um, over the next, I've got now 17 minutes and two seconds left, um, I will uh, sort of be able to, to share some of that with you. So, so I thought, what do I talk about? So, so one of the things I could talk about is um, 
how working in policing impacts on you. Andy's talked a lot about it in terms of how that impacts on your sleep. I could talk about how it impacts on mental health, on physical health, in terms of um, higher levels of cardiovascular disease, higher levels of gastrointestinal diseases, um, a whole range of, of areas um, that, that I could talk about. Um, but essentially, what I would say is that working in policing, as, as we see it, is a little bit like diving into water and um, you will get wet. It will leave a trace, to use the whole sort of low cards principle. Um, you cannot work in policing and it not have some sort of impact in some sort of way, um, denied or not. Um, and we expect people to work in policing and dive in that water and swim around like um, Olympic swimmers and be able to get up each day out of that water, dive back in again um, without sort of even giving you a towel in many cases to be able to sort of dry yourself off before you have to run again the next day. Um, so it's a, it's a tough job and as a charity we absolutely get that. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I could talk about um, some of the work that we've done in terms of conferences and how we helped Andy uh, get um, Oscar Kilo and the National Peace Wellbeing Service off the ground when it was a, a glimmer in his eye um, and, uh, and the work that we did to support that. I could talk about the grants that we've given to individuals, I could talk about the grants that we've given to police forces up and down the country. Um, in the last few years, over three million pounds worth of grants funding to, to support um, big initiatives and smaller initiatives. I could talk about our well-being rooms. Now, you may say, well, what's a well-being room? It's a safe space for, for officers to go and sort of, uh, all staff to go and spend a little bit of time in when they need to take some time out. And why is that important? And I genuinely hope all the well-being rooms that we have funded over the years have not been converted back into broom cupboards that you open and find a, a traffic cone sat inside, which is uh, one that, and I remember you sending me that photograph. Um, well-being rooms, we have proven, have an impact on um, sickness data. For those, we, we did a study with um, Kent and with Police Scotland. And for people who had access to a wellbeing room, whether they used it or not, but just knowing that it was there, halved their sickness rates, which is a huge impact. Now, a wellbeing room in itself doesn't make that difference. It's the culture and the conversations that that enables for somebody to put their hand up and say, actually, I'm not feeling too great. I need to take a bit of time out. So that's, that's something else I'm not going to talk about. I could talk about ill health retirement and the fact that the ill health retirement process and the, and the research we've done around that and the car crash of a process that does more harm to people than the actual reason why it is that they're going through an ill health retirement um, sort of process in the first place and the long-term consequences that that has on the individual and their families and the fact that 15% of people who go through an ill health retirement process, particularly around their mental health, will be living in poverty because they cannot get themselves out of that position and back into work, no matter what a medical report may say. I could talk about the Ill Health Retirement Peer Support um, initiative that we have for people to be able to get them back into work, to be able to allow them to move back on into the next phase of their life. But I'm not going to talk about that either. I could talk about the suicide prevention work that we've done in terms of suicide um, seminars to enable teams to be able to talk to each other um, when they feel that there's uh, somebody at risk and to be able to provide that peer support for people um, and that training and the language to be comfortable having those conversations. And I could talk about um, our intensive therapy service that we have for people with complex PTSD. People who, um, under any other circumstances, police career would be over and they are back at work um, and they are back functioning again as serving police officers. Not 100% success rate but not far off. I could talk about the um, work we've done to support families. Think about officers going home, seeing their children um, and children being worried about the fact that they have got signs of a physical um, assault um, and what worry that presents them for children. It can play out in terms of behaviour at school, it can play out in terms of um, sort of general anxiety for children, um, not sleeping, not concentrating at school. And so we 
produced a resource to enable um, those conversations to happen, to help diffuse that situation, give parents the skills to be able to have those conversations with children. Um, and for those of you who are interested, if we've got books for sale at the back of the room, please go and see Dom and Dave around the corner um, and they'll be more than be happy uh, to be able to, uh, to talk to you. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. I could talk about um, the research that we did uh, back in 2018, published uh, beginning of 2019, where we identified that one in five serving personnel um, within policing are living with um, clinical symptoms of PTSD. 20%, that's a huge number. Um, and. Um, the day we launched that research um, was also the day that um, somebody who's not too far away from me um, uh, said the following, which is the Police Care UK conference. It was the first conference we'd run around trauma, had thrown the gauntlet down by demanding that the police service recognises that exposure to trauma has always been part of the job. It's always been part of the policing experience and now we, the service needs to listen uh, to those who live and breathe it, as well as the experts who are committed to developing the research. And so since that day, in uh, sort of uh, 2017, when we launched that research, um, that's what we've been doing. And it's a particularly poignant day, because the day we did that conference was the same day that Keith Palmer was murdered in, in London. Um, and it's a day that will certainly be st stick with Andy and I um, as being the first day um, of, of that conference. In the years that have followed, what have we done? So we've worked really hard to get the fact that trauma is part of the job recognised. Um, we have um, benchmarked for the first time in the policing population um, what the level of PTSD is um, and listened to 18,000 people who shared their experiences around that. We've coded um, amongst that 18,000, we, we selected 1,500 at random and we worked out what the most traumatic experiences are that are most likely to result in somebody developing or, or going on to develop uh, PTSD. Um, that, um, that, that tool we published uh, for free, it's available on our website, we um, highlighted it at the last, last weekend, but it's a tool that can be used by individuals to recognise what they have been exposed to and um, by supervisors to uh, monitor their teams so that actions can be placed, put in place. Peer support, trim, whole range of interventions uh, that allow people to be able to sort of just recognise they've been to a really tough job and that they're not alone, that what they've experienced is really tough um, and allows them to take some either personal action or it allows the supervisor to take some action, um, which is, I think, a huge step forward to be able to monitor what's happening. We've developed tools to um, enable people to process what they've been exposed to. It's called TIPT, Trauma Impact Prevention Techniques, and um, it's something that um, is being uh, rolled out across a, quite a number of forces now. Um, and both um, PTEC, which is the, the checklist, and TIPT are, I understand, uh, going to be part of the, the APP that's being developed around uh, mental health and wellbeing for the for the, for the police service. So that's a huge, huge step forward in terms of being able to, to monitor and react, those, react to those things. And then finally, I could talk about our clinical therapy and um, our, the, the intensive therapy program. Um, however, despite all of that, actually, it's not me that needs to talk to you. It's the people that we help. So I'm going to play a short um, clip, um, it's, it's just a video clip, um, I will highlight that um, there is some disturbing sort of uh, pieces of material in this that um, some of you uh, may, may, may find a bit upsetting um, and there's a background heartbeat that's playing um, which um, again is something that for some people might find difficult to listen to um, but just please do close your eyes and listen. When I was an area commander, Police Care UK provided me funds to refurbish the mess room and set up a welfare room for my officers. Both elements of the funding had a massive effect on morale and helped my cops a lot. In October 2022, I was diagnosed with PTSD as a result of duties carried out in relation to disaster victim identification deployments. 
My triggers were crowds in arena-type buildings such as football stadiums, which resulted in some very negative situations for me. Unable to concentrate or even remember football matches I'd been at, I was unable to work for the best part of nine months. I contacted Police Care UK and subsequently attended the two-week residential intensive trauma service programme. The treatment was excellent and what the therapists achieved with me relating to my PTSD in the space of two weeks was quite frankly astonishing. I returned, I'm a different person and my trauma scores have dropped significantly, not only benefiting me but my family as well. My quality of life has improved greatly. I returned to work three months ago and I'm back watching football with no ill effects. I don't believe this would have been possible without Police Care UK. I felt as if I was looking at the, the world through like an opaque piece of glass. Like I could see all this stuff happening in front of me, but I wasn't really there. The noise, I remember the noise just kind of went out of my head and it was almost like complete silence. I could just see people screaming, but I just couldn't hear anything. And my emotions just shut down. I wasn't sad, but I wasn't happy either. I just went through the motions. I came to work. I strangely felt more secure at work because I had a degree of control. I was going to incidents and I could you know, do my job, and it was just, did that distracted me, but other than that, you know, I remember people getting upset, and I couldn't get upset. I, I didn't want to go to sleep, I started to have bad dreams, um, I was scared of sleep, because I knew, I knew what was, what was coming. My life started to decline in, in every kind of way, my physical health, my mental health, my relationship. So, Federation, contacted Police Care UK. Looking back now, that was the changing point. And I owe everything to that treatment. The, the relief of the stress of that on me and my family was massive. You know, this wasn't just me that it affected, it affected everybody around me as well. All the people that loved me and cared about me were affected deeply. The treatment that I've had is, has saved my life, and I don't mean that in as a metaphor, it literally has saved my life. That I could not have continued the way I was going. Uh, something bad would have happened. Um, I would have lost everything and then probably lost my life. That, that, that's what would have happened. And the sad thing is, is that I've seen this happen to other officers. And after you know, a couple of months of coming out of treatment, that's when the reality of, of how poorly I was really hit me and how much the treatment had helped and how impossible it would have been without police care to get that. And if I hadn't, if people hadn't donated to Police Care UK, I wouldn't have gone to treatment and I wouldn't be better. It's kind of given me a new enjoyment of being a police officer again. Um, and maybe so grateful for the things I have, which without police care that wouldn't have happened. As an experienced TS with almost 20 years service, I was always cognizant of looking after the welfare of my staff. What I neglected to do though was manage my own welfare whilst I was looking after theirs. Late last year, I was forced to go on sick leave due to a complete collapse in my mental health and subsequent diagnosis of PTSD. I was at a very low point and did contemplate suicide. A friend recommended I contact Police Care UK to see if they could help, and they have been amazing ever since I sent the first email inquiry. My referral was dealt with really quickly, and I've received amazing specialist support ever since. I will never be able to thank Police Care UK enough for what they've done for me. Sadly, my policing career is unlikely to continue due to my PTSD, However, I don't think I'm exaggerating to say that I probably would not be here now if it hadn't been for the support of Police Care UK. Prior to Police Care helping me, uh, I wasn't aware uh, they existed. So as well as raising money for Police Care, I also wanted to, to raise awareness for them. Uh, there are so many people out there that are still suffering and so many people in the future that no doubt will suffer from so many different events. And if police care provided such good help for me, um, it'd be great to give something back. So they're your colleagues, they're your teams, they're your friends. Um, and, you know, we do what we can to help. Um, but 
there are ways that you can help as well. And before I talk about how you can help us, I just wanted to say there are ways at which you can help your teams yourself. We talk about PTSD and that being applicable to sort of around one in five people. But when we analyse and dig into the data, what we see is that can range from as low as 8% and high, to high as almost 40%. And the difference, the variation around that is down to what it's like at work, what's their working conditions, what's the environment that they're working in, because actually all the indications are that it's not the trauma that's the problem. People accept that that is part of the job. It's the environment that they're working in. By that, what do we mean? It's about you know, how supported they feel. Asking the questions, asking how people are, recognising that they've been to a difficult job, that makes a huge, huge difference. And, may, and reminding people that they are doing meaningful work. And what we mean by that is, is, is you know, you're, make, you're going out there making a difference to people every day. Um, the, what you do, the response that, that you give to people who are sort of, you know, in a very difficult place on their darkest of days, that makes a real difference. And those are the things that will impact on whether somebody goes on to generally develop PTSD or not. You can have an impact on that. And that makes everybody's life easier. But whilst you're doing that, because I know that that is a huge, huge journey that the police service needs to go on, and it's really, it's started, and there's fantastic work that's been done by Andy and his team, by John and his team, you know, to, to sort of really start to try and address these things, but it's a long road. So, in the meantime, we will still need to be there to pick up those pieces and to try to make a difference to the people that, that come to us for all sorts of reasons. Um, as your charity of the year, this evening, you will find that there are some donation little um, QR codes on, on the dinner tables this evening, so I'll just point those out uh, before I start. Um, so please do donate. You can sign up to donate, um, whether it's directly to us or through your benevolent fund, if you're not already doing that. You can become a friend of Police Care UK um, on our website, donate in memory or in celebration. Um, you can take part in a challenge event because we do know how competitive you all are. Um, so you can get a team together and, and go onto our website and you'll see a range of challenge events that you can participate in. Um, sign up to our newsletter, talk about us, let people know that we exist. Um, and as I say, just a reminder, you can donate this evening um, and uh, Paul will be very excited when we can tell him what, the do what that total is, so, uh, so please do. Um, and in terms of how does that help, well, last year um, we helped over 1,400 families. Um, we provided over 5,000 sessions of specialist therapy, um, predominantly around trauma. Some anxiety and depression in there as well, um, but, uh, but over 5,000 sessions. Um, people who came to us for grants, 84% approved because we know that people will get into all sorts of financial difficulties, particularly around the, uh, affected by their mental health, but also in terms of adaptations of people who've had a physical injury, so um, in terms of you know, bathroom adaptations and those sorts of things, um, because uh, that will have a real impact. Um, and peer support. As I say, support of colleagues um, in service is huge, but actually having support of from people who have got that same lived experience of you, whose, whose career has been prematurely ended, and they may not have reached their 30 years, 35 years, or wherever it is that the Home Office are trying to uh, increase the uh, length of service to these days, or any, anybody sort of is able to, to move around in all of that um, personal kit um, uh, in, in sort of uh, older years, um, it defies me. I think I tried it all on about 20 years ago, and I couldn't walk then, so um, goodness knows what I'd be like in. Uh, like now. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's careers will end at all, all sorts of different points in life. And, and having the support of people who've got that same lived experience um, to allow you to transition to the police service um, is, uh, is hugely important. Um, so, uh, so they're the ways that we, you can help us, they're the ways that we can help you. Um, but I can absolutely guarantee that Police Care UK is, is around for the long term and will always be here to support the men and women and families of policing. Thank you.